Welcome first-time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli. The Sports Deli is sponsored by SportRx. Don't forget to enter the code DELI10 at checkout for your special 10% discount. And now a little bit about your two co-hosts, Dr. J and myself, Hootie Hoot. Dr. J loves politics. His dad was a civil rights lawyer. He loves golf. He loves the All-American at Waffle House. As for myself, Hootie Hoot, I'm from Detroit. I got cut three times. Once I played four years of college basketball. I still hold a record where I made five out of six three-pointers in a game. I've coached men's and women's college basketball for 23 years. I have a beautiful, amazing, incredible daughter. I'm a life coach. Remember, you can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com or you can DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. All right, we are honored on this third day of Women's History Month 2021 to be joined by millennial American Lauren Williams, who is of Trinidadian descent, who hails to us from Rochester, not New York, Pennsylvania, <laughs> which is a 41 minute drive from the Steel City down Interstate 279. She attended the U, which for those of you who don't know, it is the University of Miami where she majored in finance. We'll talk about that a little bit later. In 2015, she was inducted into the University of Miami's Hall of Fame as a result of her Miami career where she was a nine-time All-American and 11-time Big East champion in numerous events, including indoor events that are too many to name, as well as outdoor events like the 100, 200, and the 4x1 and the 4x2. She's also part of the University of Miami's Iron Arrow Honor Society, the University of Miami's highest honor, which recognizes those individuals like Lauren, who embodies the University of Miami's love of alma mater, character, leadership, scholarship, and humility. She won the 2004 NCAA 100 meter championship held in Austin, Texas. She has an MBA from the University of Phoenix and has completed her certified financial planning coursework. She was a four time Olympian competing in three Olympics in 04, 12, and in the Winter Olympics in 14, the latter being uh, in uh, Sochi, Russia. She was the first woman to win a medal at both the Summer and Winter Olympics in track and field and the two woman bobsleigh. She received the 2006 Visa Humanitarian of the Year Award. She once volunteered in elementary school where she assisted a class of deaf students. She has her own podcast, The Worth Listening Podcast, which can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts. You can find her on Instagram at Lauren. Lauren is spelled L-A-U-R-Y-N and then C Williams, plural. Lauren C. Williams, where she has over 10,000 followers. She has an even more followers on Twitter, also at Lauren C. Williams. And on her website at lauren-williams.com. And on her professional website, which is what she's involved with now, which we'll talk about later, worth-winning.com. Dot com, where she's a certified financial planner, where she helps other pro athletes and young professionals with their money. Lauren, what an honor and a huge warm welcome to the Sports Deli. I am so excited to be on today. I can't <laughs> wait to have a chat with you. Yeah, so let, let's chop it up a little bit. So um, you spoke at, uh, at, uh, at the U's, uh, at your Hall of Fame induction speech, and you talked about how it takes a village. And so, you know, I sort of want to go back um, We've had a lot of guests on the show. Someone like Jay Billis from ESPN talked about how his senior year, he had a terrible experience with his high school coach. Not that he was a bad guy, but he just was in over his head. And we have had, have had other people on like Kayla Alexander from the WNBA, whose father is a police officer. And being a woman of color, that was an interesting conversation. But she had a great experience. Didn't really have many bad experiences growing up. And you know, when you talk about it takes a village, Take us back to your, your, your earliest memories of being involved in sports and your support system and, you know, how you got involved in this. Because I know from a personal standpoint, having coached college athletics for 29 years and high school sports for 29 years, now I'm at a low income first generation high school, um, you know, and I was with Ernie Robinson and Monique Henderson uh, for a number of years uh, here in San Diego, and I worked with them. And there's something about track and field people that are just so it, their their personalities are they're intense and competitive like anyone else. But the, there's something about how they're contagious in terms of the camaraderie 
of the sport. And, and the reason that's interesting to me is because I played golf and tennis, tennis in college, and I tried to be a professional golfer at one point. Those are individual sports like track and field also, but there's something different about track and field that although it's an individual sport, it feels like a team sport. So I know it's a long winded question, but take, take us back to your earliest uh, memories and, and how your support system really helped shape you. Yeah, I would say, you know, it started very early. So if I look back at, you know, age group where, you know, people say they want to be a firefighter or a police officer, you know, you get, kind of get the typical answers as a kindergartner. Um, you know, my support system in my mother and my father taught me that education was everything. And so uh, one of the stories they love to tell is about me wanting to be anesthesiologist at five. <laughs> and it was quite a mouthful to say. Um, Did you pronounce it correctly? I, I could, I could. I <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Um, but, you know, as we think about villages, uh, my godmother was a neonatologist and wow. my godfather was an anesthesiologist. And so, wow. um, you know, originally I wanted to be like my godmother who was the, the neonatologist. So I was, I was saying that first and it was simply, <laughs> you know, as part of the village, people who looked after me, who supported me, who encouraged me, um, but also like looking at, you know, how respected they were by others. I wanted people to feel like everyone loved them. And I, want, I was like, I want people to like me the way they like them. Um, and I want to be able to afford a house that's nice like this. You know, they had a bigger house than we had sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so my parents were very intentional about putting me um, in environments where I could see people that were making the most of their situation so that I could also see, you know, I could truly do and be anything I wanted to be. So when I think of my village, it started very young. So uh, did they encourage you to play other sports or was it, were you just fast from the jump? Uh, I played everything. So karate, ballroom dancing, gymnastics, softball, uh, basketball was my favorite. You name it, I pretty much did it as it pertains to sports. Wow. Um, they didn't encourage me in one specific direction, but they knew that I had talent in track and field or running. Um, and, you know, they'll tell two different stories. My dad will tell you we were at the Carnegie <laughs> Science Center and uh, started to race a Flojo hologram that day and didn't do anything else. No, didn't see anything else at the Science Center. All I did was race the hologram. And so that's when he's like, okay, this is a little bit, you know, she's into this. Um, my mom, on the other hand, says that I got home faster than the family German Shepherd. And that's how she knew that I needed to get into track and field and, you know, put a little bit more effort in behind that. That's interesting. So how uh, did, did you ever play anything that you um, didn't really like, or you, you had some, uh, some negative experiences, or you got frustrated because you weren't necessarily great at it? And and uh, how, how'd you handle those situations? Yeah, well, I stunk at ballroom dancing. I, I stink at dancing <laughs> in general. So kind of got two left feet, not very rhythm um, oriented, you know, can't snap my fingers to the beat. Just, yeah, just not inclined in that way. That's why I run in a straight line. Yes, um, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so Perfect. definitely so sucked at that. And then um, <laughs> the other thing that I probably wasn't great at, but I really enjoyed was basketball. Um, love the team sport, love running up and down. Like I said, once again, coordination was never my strong point. So never really good at it, but I really, really enjoyed and wanted to play basketball actually, you know, after high school and just it wasn't an option for me. Because you weren't good enough or just because you not good enough. <laughs> oh, so why did you choose my, well, who else were you looking at besides Miami? I'm always curious about that question. Yeah. I took visits to Rice, um, to Cal Berkeley and to Tulane. All good track programs. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So one of the things that I usually talk about in the intro is people's birthdays. And so I left that for afterwards because it's, it's an interesting thing because as a college professor for a long time, this came up one time and I didn't, I wasn't trying to be insensitive. I didn't realize it was going to be such an emotional issue, but on your 18th birthday, 9-11 happened. And so I know that was one of the things along with Magic Johnson announcing to the world that he had HIV, where I was specifically. There's not many moments in my life where I remember where I was. Mm -hmm. So that was one of them. I was out here on the West Coast. And so I'm just curious, maybe it's nothing, but I just thought I would ask, you know, how because you have you share a birthday with Ludacris and uh, Sean Livingston, former three-time NBA champ and, and Harry Connick Jr. So I thought that was interesting. But 
but more more interesting to me is how, how did you feel that day like was there any type of like guilt or were you is it upsetting every year or was it upsetting the first couple of years maybe and now as time has gone on uh you know it's different you know how was how has that been for you yeah so in in the year that it happened i was a freshman in college um, so I'd just gotten away from, you know, small town, Pennsylvania, all the way to Miami, Florida, and was super excited. Um, you know, was ready to celebrate that evening. Like I'm a grown up, you know, <laughs> no one can tell me what to do anymore. Um, and then, yeah, you said life did not go quite as planned that day. And it was yeah. kind of one of those, like, I want my mommy <laughs> kind of Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to be a grown up anymore. So it was very, you know, traumatic to be away from home, away from friends and family, um, you know, 18 years ago, we know that, or not even, it's more than it's 20 years ago now yeah. that, um, you know, there, there just wasn't as much technology. So cell phone towers and things like that weren't working. You couldn't reach your friends. You know, had a bunch of other friends in New York that, you know, had gone to school and couldn't reach them. So yeah, it was a very kind of just shaky time. Um, and then years after that, it, like you said, the first couple of years, it was kind of like, wow, this is a day I want to celebrate and everyone else is mourning. And you want to, you know, like you said, be sensitive to it, but also celebrate your own life. So it was kind of like an awkward, you know, how, how do you be excited, but also yeah. like be, yeah, reverent to this. Totally. So you went to school at, at Miami with a lot of amazing football players in particular, um, you know, some Hall of Famers, Ed Reed and, and Jeremy Shockey. Uh, Andre Johnson, Jonathan Vilma, Willis McGahee, past Frank Gore, just some amazing players uh, and others. Um, uh, and you, you sort of talked about this also uh, in, your, in your Hall of Fame speech, uh, I think it was with, with regards to Sean Taylor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he passed away, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, at a really young age after he was only in the NFL, I think for three years, but, but were you friends with him or was it just something that it was a, it was a university of Miami kind of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, you know, you're all athletes and you, you know, you just knew about each other and, and it was just one of those types of things. So, you know, how was your experience in Miami? How did that impact you? Yeah. Um, you know, in the University of Miami, we are a very small school. A lot of people don't know that because we're a division one school, but we're about 9,000 students, I think. Mm -hmm. So in comparison to some of the other D1 schools, we're relatively small. Um, and so that made the athletic department also very small. We were very tight knit as a whole department. Um, and so Sean Taylor was one of my friends. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was you know, just terrible to hear what happened and, yeah. you know, to kind of have that unfold in our community and, and have to sort through that. It was, yeah, definitely a really tough time. And to, you know, I said, have known, we used to meet up and um, go to lunch. Uh, There's a particular semester where we kind of had the same break. And so oh. we would meet and we go to lunch every Tuesday. Wow. Um, and yeah, to know someone that, you know, you actually had conversations with that you actually, mm. you know, like you said, knew the personality wise and to see them gone way too soon was pretty tough. And um, so you had you had a lot of success at Miami and, uh, you, you know, you talked about um, how you didn't really necessarily think about the Olympics until 04 when you broke broke 11 seconds in the, in the 100 meters and uh, which is which is flying. And what tell everyone the difference between someone like uh, uh, not necessarily genders, but just someone who's tall, like Usain Bolt. And someone who's shorter like you, you know, who's five, what, three and a half on a good day? Right. Um, five, three and a quarter. So <laughs> I appreciate the extra quarter inch. But. And, and, and how maybe the, the training is different um, or, you know, the mindset, you know, what you have to do, you know, those types of things. Because I, I, I'm always fascinated. I, I mean, I love track. I could, I could watch that stuff all day long. It's just, it's amazing to me, the different events and just how people prepare for it and train and, and just stuff like that. So what's, what's the difference though, being a shorter, even, even with some of your own other uh, of the best uh, women runners in the world, you know, they're, they're not, they're taller. Yeah, you've got to be able to turn your legs over faster if you have shorter legs. So I've got to take two strides for, you know, every one that a taller person takes. So they're going to be able to cover more ground. Um, I'm going to have to be a lot more quickly with covering my ground in shorter steps. So I'm going to take more steps than someone that is taller. Uh, and I've got to be able to do that, like you said, at at least like double the rate sometimes, <laughs> if you know, you're up against someone as tall as you saying boat. Uh, did you uh, work on explosive training? What, do, what did you do to get faster? I'm curious. 
Yeah, I am a power athlete. So some athletes are built on, you know, strength and endurance. Uh, and there's others that are built on power. So I did a lot of weightlifting. Mm-hmm. Um, I could squat 365 pounds, um, you know, deadlift, probably, I think, well, power clean, like 200. Um, yeah, pretty good numbers, I think, for a girl. But um, it, it was a lot of weightlifting, uh, benching, squatting, like I said, Olympic lifts, things like that, that are really important just as much as training on the track. I didn't run very far. So a lot of people think like, oh, how many miles do you run? That's what I get all the time. It's like, I'm a sprinter. I don't run miles. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. This ain't the steeplechase. <laughs> exactly. 250 <laughs> meters was a really long day for me. Totally. Yeah. Lou Scott was my cross country coach. I don't know if that name uh, means anything to you. He was an alternate in the 68 Olympics. And uh, so I ran cross country in high school and I was always the rabbit. Uh, I was dead by the, by the time it was done, but I did my job. And so, but uh, I know what kind of training uh, cross country people go to and yours is, is a little bit different, right? Not as, not as many long, you don't do any long distance, right? It's just more 200, maybe 200 and 400, but, but nothing more than that. Right. Yeah. 250 was the furthest I ever went distance oh, wow. wise. Yeah. Interesting. That's cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit in the rapid fire questions. I have some, some things about the Olympics. I know you've talked about that a lot and I want to talk about your business and cause that's very interesting to me because one of our guests uh, not only was almost homeless, former NBA player, um, cause I know you want to talk a lot about what you're doing with that and helping people with their, with their finances, especially professional athletes who don't know what they're doing and are broke within five years of, you know, uh, finishing their careers. Um, but he almost sold his pension too. And, wow. uh, he took emergen- an emergency loan out, um, because his wife needed it for something, uh, that was personal. And then, so he needed the pension years later and someone advised him not to do it. So he, he didn't thank goodness. Um, And then we, we ended up as a result of him being on the show, we raised uh, $3,000 for him um, because he was going to be homeless with, with his wife and his kids. It's just amazing. And he reached out to NBA players. Nobody would help him. And, you know, he was in the same draft with a, a very famous player who's still playing in the league today. So I don't want to name names. And the other interesting part to that is uh, that his financial planner, um, you know, there's a lot of bad people in, in a lot of different businesses. Um, you're one of the good ones, uh, clearly. Um, but his financial planner took him to the cleaners, wiped him out completely. And uh, as you'll talk about later, you know, he had no understanding of what was going on, just entrusted this person, uh, to take care of everything, you know, instead of educating him every step of the way, you know, uh, and taking care of those things. Um, just, just an very unfortunate situation, but, but he's doing a lot better now. Hey everyone, this is Hootie Hoot from the Sports Deli Podcast. We hope you've got your favorite beverage and your favorite deli sandwich or bagel as you're joining us here today, as we are joined by Lauren Williams, the first American woman in the history of the United States to medal in both the Summer and Winter Olympic Games. Lauren will detail later what went wrong in the bobsled that caused her and her teammate to have to settle for the silver medal in the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics in Russia. And she will now share her thoughts about the racial reckoning since the death of George Floyd right here in the Sports Deli. For Dr. J, I'm Hootie Hoot. Now back to the interview with former three-time Olympic champion, Lauren Williams, right here in the Sports Deli. Um, I want to ask you, um, and I want to frame it in a way where it, it sort of um, is in alignment with something that, that you said in one of your Instagram posts. Uh, and it's interesting, about 25 years ago, I was in a diversity training. And, you know, the guy was a friend of mine. And back then it was just sort of like, you know, you make fun of people, you talk shit, you know, it's just like, man, shut up with that, you know. And, but looking back, I told, and I've told him this, he, he's, uh, he works in North Carolina A&T now. And he was on the show uh, during one of our shows, we were talking about the racial reckoning. And um, he said in his diversity training that he was on an airplane, similar to you. And he walked by the cockpit and did a double take and he saw a Hispanic guy in the cockpit and he said to himself, not out loud. Oh, hell no. I know he ain't flying this plane. And, you know, he told us a story and, you know, he, he was sort of, I don't know if he was ashamed of it, but he just said, you know, this is this 
mindset that we have. And so similar to, to your Instagram post, you, you know, you saw this, this African-American gentleman in the cockpit and you were so, I'll let you say, you know, what you felt, but uh, you want this to be more of a normal thing. And so I want to sort of transition into this uh, racial reckoning, some of the things that happened this past summer. And uh, I always sort of bring up the WNBA versus the NBA versus the NFL, because there are some distinct differences there in how those things have been, are being handled and have been handled. So, you know, as I'm talking about this, what are your what, what comes to mind with regards to where we are, we're at in this country and, and how you approach all of this? Yeah, I mean, I think we're in a really tough place right now as a country where, um, you know, the narrative is very divisive. Um, you know, while while there is sort of a, a awakening or some of some sort happening, um, I always worry about like you know what's being said, uh, and it's it's just a really tough thing to navigate. Uh, I think on both sides, so um, it's not just for people of color to to navigate this thing. It's also you know white people that are being affected, um, and so I think the thing that's most important right now is that we be able to enter into discussion um, on both sides, you know, like, you know, a white male right now talking to a black female and, and we'd be able to just, you know, be open and honest about it. I think this is the thing that we have to create a lot more um, instead of, like I said, sides, like you don't understand us or uh, I don't get this and I, don't, I shouldn't have to invest this much time into it. Like, I feel very much that like what I hear is very divisive. Like um, a lot of my friends said, if you don't stand up, you know, as my white friend and, and say something about this, I'm not your friend anymore. And, you know, from my point of view, it's like, why does someone have to get on social media or, um, you know, speak out publicly about, you know, all the things that are happening when there may be things they're doing behind the scenes um, to make a, a meaningful difference in what's going on in the world. So there's not one way to create meaningful change in the world. Um, and we shouldn't be holding people or telling people how they need to do their change. We need to be focus on the way that we want to change and then also engaging others in change instead of, like I said, delegating change. Yeah, no, you bring up a good point. There's a lot of people that have shared that sentiment that I've spoken with. Um, and, I, and I'm going to touch on that in a second because there's one person that I sort of disagree with, uh, with regards to your, to your statement. Um, but um, when you, when you think of this uh, fight that the black and brown community has has been talking about for so long and really it's fallen on deaf ears uh the continuation of being marginalized uh for overtly and covertly um you know it's um it's something that i personally am taking more responsibility for as as a as a white jewish man because i feel like i've been complicit and it's not enough to say oh man i grew up in detroit you know, like I'm not racist. You know, I think um, the more that you listen and learn, you realize that you have to be anti-racist, which maybe that's sort of a buzz thing that people are saying now. But um, I'm reading Just Mercy now. I went, I read White Fragility. I read Obama. Um, you know, and and I'm from Detroit. I, I've been in diverse locker rooms for 29 years. You know, I, I have a probably a different understanding than some people. But I want to ask you about your feeling on Tom Brady, because it's the person that I bring up a lot, because I don't think there's one white man in America that has the impact or potential impact that he has across a lot of different realms. And Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods have received a lot of criticism over the years. Uh, but I don't think anything uh, compares to what's going on now in this window of opportunity that we have for the uh, arguably the most influential white person uh, in sports uh, that we have in this country to speak out. And I guess I expected more from him. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I'm, I guess I'm bummed in a way also that even if he is doing it behind the scenes, like you've said, um, that he hasn't done more because I think there's a lot of white people that listen to white people, unfortunately, even if you say the same thing and black people are going to listen, the black and brown community are going to listen to the black and brown community. Yeah, um, I think that, you know, really the, the thing is, like you said, people figuring out where they fit in. And you brought up a really good point, Michael, about like, you know, hey, I realized like you could you could have just said like, I know black people. I've, I've known black people my whole life. I lived in Detroit. Um, but you decided to say, you know, after some self-reflection, what else can I learn? 
Um, and where else can I go get resources to learn these additional things? Um, and I think that's the thing that is missing is, you know, people deciding that I want to be a better person. I want to reach my full potential and I want to go above and beyond to make sure that I understand what's going on. Because the easy thing to do is just ignore this. And when you bump into someone, you know, try to be nice and, you know, not, not say that you're one side or the other, you're not racist, you're not this, you just don't happen to have any people of color, you know, friends that are people of color or something like that. Um, so the easy thing to do is kind of business as usual, but challenging yourself to be very intentional about what you do is a thing that each person has to go on that journey on their own. So, you know, while Tom Brady does have a, a big platform, while this is something that is at the forefront, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, he's got to be able to rest well at night. Um, and if, you know, he, he rests well without, you know, saying anything and not challenging himself to go to another level, not challenging himself to look more deeply, to look at other perspectives, to, you know, read books like Right Fragility or, you know, and I think those, those kind of, all the different kinds of books that exist and resources that are out there now, both sides need to be reading about those things. Um, Hillbilly Elegy is one that I've read recently that did a really good job of, of explaining, you know, where some other points of view views come from. Um, but you have to first decide, like, if I'm going to reach my full potential, I need to learn more and I need more resources to do that. Um, and I'm going to dedicate the time. The other thing I think about, you know, we talk, we're talking race right now, but religion, you know, some people are hardcore, you know, Christian or hardcore, you know, Islam or Muslim. Um, and you can't say, you know, this, this thing is, this is my thing and your thing is bad unless you know what is, you know, you've done some research onto my thing. So how far be it for me to be a Christian and say that, you know, nation of Islam or that being a Muslim is not the right religion and that, you know, those people are going to hell as an example um, when I haven't done proper research into that religion to understand, know what they feel, what they believe, et cetera. And I think it's the same thing with race. We cannot just say, oh, I, you know, I know some black people and I know everything about it or I, you know, I've, I've done this, this much of this, so I'm okay. You know, what actually have you done to really understand the other person's point of view, the other person's perspective? Um, until you've made a, a definite effort, you can't say, oh, you know, you make these generalizations, which is what I think is the problem right now. Yeah. And, but to your point, right, uh, we hear another person telling uh, LeBron to shut up and dribble. Um, and, the, I, I guess beyond Tom Brady, the, the part that I guess frustrates me, that embarrasses me as a white man, is the arrogance, and I've said this many times on the show before, the arrogance of the non-black and brown community mm. to think that they know better than the people that are saying, even though I'm rich, I'm scared, even though I'm famous, I still have to have the same talk with my kids, even though I'm famous, uh, I'm scared to walk out of my house every day and I look over my shoulder when a cop drives by uh, and crying like Doc Rivers at the podium when he should be talking about basketball uh, is more concerning than how many people voted for the 45th president. Right. So the, the lack of not just empathy, but just, just literally listening to the people of the black and brown community are not making this stuff up. They're not looking for attention and black lives mattering. That slogan is, is somewhat uh, um, mind blowing in and of itself that it just should be mattering. You know, we're, 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 black lives should be equal, right? That should be the slogan maybe. But anyway, so I guess that for me personally, that as I continue to educate myself, and want to be a part of mobilization and not just talking. That's the frustrating part to me. And I've, I, I've uh, unfriended uh, family members. I don't talk to people anymore in my family. I do not have uh, certain friends anymore. And they can keep stepping because um, I personally don't want to be an example to my daughter uh, in the other direction. I want her to, to make her own, you know, decisions about how she sees all of this. But um, you know, and some people aren't introspective and that's the reality of it. They just care about economics and they exactly. just care about other things. And they're not even going to, this isn't even on their radar. 
Yeah, I think that's the key thing is like you said, not being introspective, but how do we can't force someone to be introspective. Like you said, in your immediate yeah. family, your household, you know, you get to, you know, talk to your daughter about your values and your vision for her and, you know, things that you want to see oh, for her life and, you know, shape her into a productive human being. Yeah. Um, but, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, they still get to choose, you know, as she becomes an adult, she should have been shaped by you. Um, but there are people out there that we just don't get to have any influence over. Uh, and we We've got to hope that there's someone in their life that is is pro, pro, poking and prodding them to be introspective. Um, and when they when they're not, and they seem to have the intellect to be, and are just choosing not to, uh, you know, that's when you end up in a situation where, like you said, you want to unfriend or you know just kind of cut them out of life because they should know better and they should do better. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, there's definitely progress. There, there's better situations and spaces uh, that people are. Uh, involved in now. I was on a panel um, uh, yesterday uh, that was talking about this very issue about the NFL, and I'm on an advisory board. I'm I'm a peripheral uh, connector. I don't know what I am, but because of the space that I'm in with you, it's allowed me to to talk to famous professors from Harvard and um, former NFL coaches, Super Bowl MVPs, and listen to them you know, and try and help pay that kind of thing forward and educate because most of our listeners are in their 40s and 50s and they're white. And so I welcome, you know, thoughtful discourse and dialogue. I've had people call me and say, I don't understand what you're talking about. And so, you know, a couple of people I've spoken to for hours just trying to explain to them some of the, the straightforward things like the economics, the education, the, the implicit uh, bias and and systemic racist things that that are involved in this country, you know the f- fact that white people with the same degrees make six times as much money, you know just basic things uh, that they don't understand. There's no internet in certain inner cities, you know, and there's white people in those places too, but it's it's disproportionately uh, biased against the black and brown community and, and the Hispanic community, to be quite honest with you. And it's so cool that you get to be a catalyst for, um, you know, creating that change for others, because like you said, there, there is just a gap, you know, we take for granted that there are 330 million people in America and they're from all different backgrounds, all different sets of resources and media available to them. Um, Mm -hmm. Some people truly do live under a rock. And so they stumble upon your podcast um, and they're like, Oh, like, I like this guy. I've always been listening. And now he's talking about this thing. And it's like, I don't know about this. And so it's like, now you get to have that opportunity to say, here's some books you can go read. I never knew these things. Um, and now, you know, you get to be a voice that they're, they're open to hearing, share that message, but it, it has to first start with the, you know, people being um, in a situation where they feel like they want to use their platform for that. So I definitely applaud you for, you know, taking that stance, having that platform and, and not feeling uncomfortable talking about it because it's not the easiest thing in the world to talk about. Um, and it's not the most popular thing in the world to talk about. Yeah, no, it's not. And, uh, you know, but you do have to listen to their side. And I always ask myself, how would it be for me to go to the racist side? <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we're asking a lot of people to do, right? We're asking them to come all the way over or in the middle, you know, and, um, you know, I had Doug Gottlieb on the show and, and he doesn't necessarily think he knows there's uh, racism and he's, he has said publicly that black lives matter, but there's a lot of people that have these platforms that don't, you know, most of the people that you hear about are Steven Jackson or Tom Thomas, who was on this show as well, you know, uh, people in the black and brown community who we already know they know, you know, mm-hmm. so hopefully we, we just continue to have the conversation, like you said, and, um, Let's transition into um, your, your, your business, because that's very interesting to me. Like I said, I shared that story with you earlier, uh, and, and he's not alone. There's a lot of people that are in those situations. So talk about, talk about Worth Winning and what you're doing, and uh, you want to name names? No, I'm just playing. Uh, <laughs> but no, just, just t- tell everyone how it's going, and because and, you, you obviously majored in finance at, at Miami, and you got your MBA, and, and uh, you know, it must be fun to to talk to people about Bitcoin or diversifying or, you know, whatever it is that you, that you talk to them about. Right. Are you, I do work in conjunction with, with, uh, with like sports agents so that, you know, you're collaborating or you're just by yourself and they have to find you or you look, you look for We'd have to go back to that race conversation if we wanted to talk about. Um, so your video talked about that, right? This, this whole thing started because you just didn't feel like you were being marginalized basically. Mm -hmm. 
exactly. So, um, you know, in the big three sports, so basketball, um, football, hockey, uh, MLB. So I guess big four in that regard. Yeah. Um, there's just not a lot of women. Um, and the sports agents are not open to uh, working with women. Um, you know, I said they don't look like me. So I haven't had a whole bunch of people of color uh, sports agents that I've bumped into. Um, and there's a lot of pay to play. Uh, which is not in line with my values. So I want an athlete to want to work with me because he or she thinks that I am the best financial advisor of the people they've interviewed, um, mm -hmm. which is easier said than done because a lot of these athletes are young. You know, I, I know what that feeling is like. I was 20 years old when I became a professional. Um, there's a lot you don't know. Um, there's a lot you haven't experienced as it pertains to money. A lot of questions you don't know how to ask, um, but they end up with the best sales pitch or the person who bought them the you know nicest steak dinner and picked them up in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce or things like that. And that's not what you know organized finances are about. Uh, so it's been really hard to break into um, the, the bigger sports and, like you said, to build those relationships with agents. Um, you know, just even in track and field, you know, my small sport uh, where I know the agents that have been, you know, there for the duration of my career. It was started in 04. So, you know, we're now 16 years down the road and some of them are still agents. Um, you know, people just looking at you like, oh, you're an athlete. And so because you're an athlete, you can't be anything else. Uh, they don't see my degree, my finance degree, my master's degree, my certified, you know, financial planning cert certification, um, you know, all these other things that I've gone and, you know, gotten above and beyond to make sure that I'm not just credible, but um, that I have the proper competency to be able to serve these athletes to the best of their ability. I just signed up for a venture capital course that's gonna be two weeks um, to be able to better serve people. So it's been a really tough ride. Um, you know, like I said, trying to figure out how to be able to serve, you know, and this is the, the audience that I really am passionate about serving. So, you know, my story, like you said, you made mention of is basically I had two financial advisors, neither of them did a really good job for me. Um, and so that's what prompted me to start my own firm. So Worth Winning is now five years old. We serve young professionals and professional athletes and it's built on the premise that, you know, athletes and young professionals deserve to get access to financial advice that is unbiased, um, easy to understand. People are not talking over your head, telling you, don't worry, your pretty little head. Um, and we're getting rid of that idea that, you know, athletes should be enabled. Don't, you know, like you said, shut up and dribble is... <laughs> is kind of the the thing it's it's similar and fine like you don't need to worry about it i'll handle all your finances for you you just go play that is the worst thing we can do for athletes in all aspects of their life we need to make them well-rounded individuals and we need to let them know that they can do um can understand what's going on in their financial life and other aspects of their life because once sport is over you will have to learn how to be a grown-up um so you better learn how to be a grown-up now so that's kind of you know where this business was built and like i said where my passion lies well, and the relatability uh, is just an unspoken, you know, connection that you have, no matter what the sport is. Um, okay, so let's get into the rapid fire. Okay, buckle your seatbelts. All let's right, do let's okay. do it. How long did you spend in Detroit? I was there from age three until sixth grade, so oh, three so to you, twelve. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so uh, Rochester or Detroit? Uh, both <laughs> <laughs> rapid fire. You, unless it's a question that doesn't require a response, you got to choose one. Oh, no, you don't. I <laughs> no, love you don't. both of my hometowns dearly. I am 50, 50 split down the middle and, and both have been so good to me. When we go back to taking a village, you know, it really did take a village. And I, I, I have two distinct separate villages that uh, were very, very instrumental in, in building me into the person I am today. Where in Detroit did you live? Uh, seven mile on the lodge freeway. Ooh, we weren't far from each other. I was in Oak Park. Okay. Yeah. West yeah, Siders. So that's, yeah. That's, that's not far away at all. Yeah. I graduated from Oak Park and, and then I came out West, uh, after high school. That's very interesting. So Eminem or Jay-Z? Ooh, I'm going Jay-Z. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Way to stay true <laughs> to your Detroit roots. Uh, all right. Favorite non-Nike track and field shoe? Non-Nike track and field shoe. I don't have to go with Saucony then. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's a great, I mean, great running shoe. People don't know about Saucony. I know. They always say Saucony. I know I said right. Saucony when I first bumped into it. <laughs> that's a great shoe. Okay. Um, obviously won the gold in 2012 in London, but from an experience standpoint, what was your favorite city? Uh, Greece, Beijing, London, or, or Sochi? 
Um, you were in fourth. Would you come in fourth place? And you came in fourth place in Beijing. Right? Dreadful fourth oh, place. Um, God, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. For anybody listening, they always ask. You know, like <laughs> you'd much rather get eighth place than fourth place at the Olympic Games. It is totally the worst. Thing. Yeah, that's like losing at the buzzer versus getting blitzed by twenty in basketball, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's so much more painful. Um, so I'm picking London. Uh, hmm. You know, really? Western wow. country, well put together, very organized. Um, you know, they had the village, you could walk from the village over into, um, the venues. So it was very easy for the athletes to be able to participate and see other things. Um, mm. just a really great experience. Uh, Greece, people were rude, Beijing, wow. there was not enough infrastructure. So there's not a, you know, English speakers to help you get around. Mm. Um, not a lot to do because, you know, the smog was an issue and things were kind of spread out. Whew. Um, and, and Russia, yeah, it was, it was summertime <laughs> in the winter Olympics. So whacked where, where 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 was the the best food Ooh, best food probably greece yeah greece yeah. definitely had the best food of those four so so food in rochester or detroit Ooh, definitely detroit <laughs> we've got things in detroit <laughs> rochester i guess we could we could go off of the pittsburgh things and get like right i was gonna say pittsburgh yeah yeah that's true yeah definitely yeah. uh so which which opening ceremony did you like the best I only attended the Greece and the, that might be it. Did I go to Solji? I don't think I did. Yeah. Wow. How come? <laughs> because Greece was so long. Uh, it was like oh. a 12 hour day. Um, so everyone always like, this is a question that we get all the time as Olympians. Like, wow, where are the opening ceremonies? We're just amazing. <laughs> and what they don't realize is what you all see on TV is not what we are experiencing. You know, we're in like a bus as a holding area. Like first you're in the village standing outside, then you get in a bus, then you sit in the, you know, you go to wherever you're going, you sit in the bus, then you go from the bus to like a gymnasium or some kind oh of holding God. area there. And then everybody is walking around country by country. And then, so you're under the stadium. Like we, we miss all of it. And then we come out and we walk, you know, do our lap oh, around and that's wow. it. So. Interesting. Uh, so what track and field athletes did you look up to growing up? Did you, did you aspire to be, or did you get advice from any of them? No. Um, no. In fact, my mom loves to tell the story of me being at a, a track and field <laughs> meet um, in North Carolina and Marion Jones was there and everybody was running over to get her autograph and, you know, pictures and all that stuff. My mom was like, Lauren, don't you want to go over and say, hi, it's Marion Jones. And I was like, no. And she's like, but she's the fastest one. And I'm like, isn't the goal to beat her mom? Like, why would I want to take a picture with somebody that I'm going to try to race at some point? Like, and so she was just like, what's wrong with my child? Like she didn't see any celebrities. She just sees competitors. So. Hey, there you go. Hey, well, that's, that's that edge that you need. Uh, so did you go to, any, did you go watch Michael Phelps or did you do, did you go to any other events that you really like love to watch your fellow Olympians compete? I, I did. I watched a little bit of everything. Um, in Rio, I got to see Simone Biles compete. That was pretty cool. Ooh. Um, in London, I got to see Michael Phelps compete. Mm. Um, Rio also got to see Usain Bolt, you know, do his hundred meter race. Uh, yeah, some good, I got to see some really good competitions take place in live and, and, and in the moment. And they were really good. You think the Olympics has changed? Like, I remember when I was a kid, like it's a little bit before you, maybe, maybe a decade before, but like, that's what everybody lived, right? Everyone lived for the Olympics. Like that was it. And then the basketball players in 92 went professional when they, you know, grabbed from that pool of players and the dream team. But in other sports, do you think it's 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 just as prominent and something that people strive for like they used to? Maybe in your sport it is because that's the main thing, right? Yeah, I think people strive for it the same way. I think, you know, some have become disenchanted because they realize that it's not a earning opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some, you know, you think like, oh, if I win a gold medal, you know, my life is going to be so much better. And in Olympic sports, we just don't earn the same way that, like I said, those big four sports do. Um, you, you've got to be one of the 1% of the 1%. So, you know, to make an Olympic team has already put you in an elite class to win an Olympic medal, you know, makes that pool even smaller. Mm -hmm. And then to be a gold medalist or a world record holder, you know, um, there's almost no one that is going to, you know, fall into those categories. And I know Olympic gold medalists that don't earn six figures, you know? So mm -hmm. you would think, yeah, I think a lot of people have that impression. Like, of course, if you're an Olympic gold medalist, you're one, you're the best in the world at that event. 
surely you earn at least a hundred thousand dollars a year. And you know, I think they would probably even think of us as millionaires, but um, that's just not the case. And I think as athletes have come to learn that, like I said, lived in their car, worked three jobs, um, you know, done all the sacrificing or, you know, made all the choices to where um, things could pay off on their behalf. They don't actually pay off monetarily and it leaves mm. them just kind of feeling angry and bitter. And mm. now people are getting more aware of that and not really pursuing it in the same way they previously were. What a bummer. That really is. Uh, did you ever try curling when you were at the Winter Olympics? I love curling. <laughs> I did not try curling. Um, <laughs> I used to go and watch, though, in Calgary, Canada, they have a curling, um, like, a, not a gym, but a rink, I guess it is. And I would go and sit and watch uh, some days after our practice for bobsled. How good do you think you'd be at the, at the brushing? <laughs> yeah, it's like pool. Like, I have no, like, golf pool and curling to me are all in the same realm. Um, and I couldn't do any of them. I don't have patience. I'm not, you, you have to have kind of like no, a balance. Type mind. Yeah. Yeah. The sliding on the knee and the whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, that's funny. Uh, so have you seen the movies, cool runnings, chariots of fire and I am bolt. I have not seen. I am bolt. Uh, I know mm. it's a little dog in that one. I did not know what this, like, it looks like, but <laughs> I don't know what I am bolt is about. I got to watch that one. So you saw the first two. Yes. What's your, so which which one of those two do you prefer? prefer? I'm going to go with Cool Runnings because I'm a bobsledder. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I learned that it's nothing like bobsled at all. Like, it's just a gross exaggeration. Right. <laughs> None of it is similar to bobsledding for real. So uh, that's an interesting uh, transition. So obviously your speed is very important in bobsledding, right? And getting into the bobsled is like the difference. And you lost the gold by a tenth of a second, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so was there anything that you could have done differently? Do you like look at film and say, ah, oh, that's where we lost the 10th of a second. You lean well, the wrong we had a right. little, Yeah, we had a bump in the driving. So, you know, we hit a wall at the very beginning that kind of like we pick up the speed and then we lost the speed immediately uh, at the, at the oh. very top of the track. And it's hard to get it back once you lose it. So um, that was a situation for us. Um, you know, I mean, I guess I could have run, a little bit faster so that we could have, you know, <laughs> maybe would have offset that bump, but just kind of comes with the territory. It was the best experience of my life, you know, to be able to do it with someone, you know, to participate and go for a gold with someone was a really cool opportunity, much different than track and field where, you know, it's every man or woman for themselves. Yeah. How, did someone approach you and just say, Hey, you're quick. You have low center of gravity. Like, would you like to consider doing this? Or did you, did you approach someone? I had actually read an article about um, some other track girls trying it the previous year and Mm. bumped into one of them in the airport on the way to a track and field race and just asked them about it. Like, Hey, like I saw you were doing bobsled. Like, what's that about? And I was getting ready to retire. So I was looking at it as more like something recreational that would be fun to do. And she's like, girl, you know, it's the Olympic year and they're looking for people like you definitely could do it. And I was like, Oh, for real. And so that's how I bumped into bobsled. Wow. That's crazy. Uh, Waffles, French toast, pancakes. Pancakes. Mm, interesting. Anything in them or on them or P- banana pancakes or chocolate chip? <laughs> you come on, Diego. I got you. They got a local restaurant here that Tiger Woods has been to, uh, Troy Palomalu. Uh, it's called uh, Brothers Restaurant. It's here. It's local, and their chocolate chip pancakes and their grandma's pancakes are fire. Okay. Yeah, for for real. Okay. Uh, what color is your toothbrush? Uh, purple. Interesting. Would you rather snuggle with a snake or a penguin? A penguin for sure. <laughs> Who snuggles with a snake? So I've asked this question the last couple and I think it's funny. So I'm going to ask you as well. Would you rather be slapped in the face by a fish or farted on? I'm definitely going to be slapped in the face. By a fish. <laughs> if you could be anyone for a day, who would it be? Ooh, probably Oprah. Really? Not Ellen? No. Not, Oprah not, sure. not an Ellen fan. I'm, I'm not not an Ellen fan. Oh, I'm just okay. more of an Oprah fan. Yeah, Oprah or Harpo. Oprah. <laughs> okay, that was random. I didn't have that on my list of questions. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. So, uh, what's on your bucket? You have one thing on your bucket list that you're like just dying to to do. Uh, Madagascar, the Galapagos Islands. Um, I've got all the things. Uh, I want to base jump, but I'm kind of terrified. So that's like, I need to get over myself. Um, (laughs) 
Yeah, I'm an adventurer. Uh, nice. I've been to, it would have been 50. I'm at, I'm at 48 countries. So I'm trying wow. to get to 50. Um, yeah, I, I love all things adventure. So. Wow, that's incredible. 48 countries. My aunt has been to 49 states. Hawaii is the only one she hasn't been to. So, God, you've been to 48 countries. That's yeah. sick. Yeah. Uh, I want to do the 50 states as well. That's, yeah, that's definitely a bucket list item. I started to, to travel a little bit more, um, in, you know, domestically because of the pandemic. So it's like, you can't go anywhere international mm -hmm. right now anyway. So did South Dakota this year, did Mount oh, Rushmore. Wow. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, starting to make my way around the states as well. Yeah, I want, I want to pull a John Madden. I want to get in a Winnebago and go around the country and go to different sports stadiums. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Describe yourself in three words. Um, ooh, uh, easygoing, authentic, and food lover. How about that? Ooh, there we go. What's your favorite uh, dish to cook? Favorite dish to cook? I would say... I don't think I, ha I love to cook in general. Um, mm. I've been on a muscles kick lately because um, it's so expensive in the restaurants and you realize like muscles are like $3 if you buy them yourself. <laughs> like totally. cheapest meal ever and amazing. <laughs> That's cool. Um, describe your favorite kiss in two words. Favorite kiss? Yeah. Uh, I would say my grandma. My grandma died last year um, and I kissed her on her birthday. And so she's like, just give me one more kiss. One more Aww. kiss. You know, every time I was getting ready to leave and she was in a nursing Aww. home. And she, so it was like very childish in nature, but a really cool memory of her. Aww. What's your favorite story about your grandma? Um, she loved to cook too. So she would love, like if she got older and her memory started to go, she would just, like talking to you would be telling you a recipe. All right, I'm going to teach you how to make so-and-so. And I'm like, well, what do you do next grandma? And she would just go through on and on and on about all these things that she wanted to prepare and cook. So, uh, that's cool. So wait, beach or snow? Beach. If you could talk in your sleep, what would you say? <laughs> Um, I talk about all the things that I have to do the next day. I know I talk <laughs> in my sleep now. Like it's just mine never cuts off because you're like thinking about client work and stuff. Right. Totally. Uh, so do you put the toilet paper on so that the roll goes out over the top or do you pull it from under? Over the top. Oh under yeah. Is a, yeah. Not a mm -mm. thing. Oh, that is definitely not a thing. So invisible or ability to fly. Ooh, that's a good one. Invisible. Where would you go first? Um, all the places where you think people are talking about you. You want to know what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's messed up. <laughs> Beyonce or Whitney? Whitney, for sure. How many books have you read this year so far? Mm, maybe six. Oh, wow. So wait, what, 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 what are you reading now? Uh, I just finished Leading with Character. It's really good. Well, I'm an audible person. Yeah, Leading with Character by Jim Lohar, L-O-E-H-R, was a great book. I'm actually going to, I did it on Audible. I'm going to buy the book and do it over again. Wow. Um, yeah, you miss things on Audible. Yeah. You Were Born for This is a book about doing everyday miracles. Mm -hmm. This is How It Always Is, is a great book. Highly recommend by Lori Frankel. Um, it's about a kid that was transgender, well, like from a very young age. And so like you said, as we challenge ourselves to think outside of a box, what I've been mm -hmm. doing this year, because I'm obviously a minority, um, is like, you know, how could I put myself in the shoes of, you know, a, a minority? Like, you know, I think white people are like, I can't be black. And I'm like, well, I'm already black. I can't be, you know, like, how do I put myself in a position to understand like how someone else might be feeling? And for me, it's been looking at, you know, the LGBTQ community and the way that they mm -hmm. are being treated. So it's a really good book to just kind of like shine light on uh, the various perspectives as it pertains to, you know, how someone could become transgender and how they had to sort through and navigate that. Yeah, that's cool. Maya Reddy, a professional golfer was on our show and she's uh, an advocate uh, and some of the things that she had to deal with in that golf space was terrible, but now she's in law school, still play pro golf. So if you want to listen to something interesting in that same space, in that same vein, you could, you could check that out. Selfish plug. 
Uh, <clears throat> what product would you refuse to promote? Product I would refuse. Uh, supplements, all supplements. I don't do supplements. Really? Yeah. No powders, wow. no pills. Yeah. Not even a multivitamin or a multimineral? Wow. Oh, natural. Interesting. You're not a vegan? No. No. Oh, well. <laughs> Uh, use one word to describe your computer ability. Uh, <laughs> deplorable. <laughs> if, you're, if your plane was about to crash, who would you want sitting next to you? Ooh, I don't want to kill anybody with me. Anybody I care about, I don't want them to be on the plane too. <laughs> <laughs> so a stranger. Yeah, I would probably pick someone I don't like. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like the 45th president. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite Halloween costume? Um, pumpkin, maybe. Really? Interesting. Yeah, it's simple, straight to the point. So is there a trend that you don't get? Um, things that I don't get. Uh, oh, eyelashes. Really hate I, eyelashes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, actually. People put like caterpillars on their face. I don't, yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Um, I love all things Mary J. Blige. Hmm. So Mary J. Blige or Whitney? Ooh, that wasn't can't one of my questions choose. either <laughs> can't make me choose between them um i mean mary mary's my favorite but whitney is like undisputably like just great so whitney or beyonce whitney whitney okay. all right well <laughs> i'm changing my answer kayla said beyonce the other day so she's a uh, WNBA player okay uh oh, nice. how old were you when you had the worst haircut ever Mm, I had a jerry curl when I was a kid, so that was wow. pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, a couple more. And uh, what's your right. least favorite type of music? Um, the tech. Like, yeah, I don't get that at all. It's very exhausting, and no. Totally. Maybe when you were younger and in the club or something. Uh, if you were a superhero, who would you be, and what would your powers be? Um. Well, we already said I could be invisible, so I'd probably like, yeah, I'd like to read minds or he said mm. be invisible. Anything like that where you can kind of spy on folks and kind of <laughs> like <laughs> understand what they're really thinking and feeling, um, I think it'd be important. Okay. Uh, so what would you want to get from a fortune cookie? Um, probably something about getting an additional monetary fortune. So yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so you're going to get, you know, more money than you ever need forever and ever sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you build it, they, yeah, if you build it, they, they will come. So you're, you're following one of your passions. So, so that's yeah. good. So if there's one question that if you were me, you would have asked, what, what would it have been that I didn't ask? Um, or, or that you've been asked before. What's your you've favorite animal? It, well, I know it's a dog, right? What kind of dog, though? Um great dane it is a great thing <laughs> you did research. my homework i did my homework <laughs> Woo, let's go <laughs> let's go oh that's hilarious all right. all right well we'll leave the stage for you we're right at that hour mark uh it's, it's been great sharing space with you and and uh, i'm always like pinching myself when i talk to super bowl mvps uh major league baseball all-stars olympians it's uh it's truly an honor, and, and uh, I hope you know that uh, uh, what you're doing is amazing. But anything else that we didn't touch on that you want to share with? We've been in 20 countries. We're, you know, we're doing a lot better, but really it's just about continuing the conversation and bridging these equality, social injustice gaps. You know. Yeah. No, I think you did an awesome job. Um, thanks for having me on the show. I am going to go make a difference in somebody's financial life now. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, much love, much respect. Thanks for coming on. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. We'll stay in touch. All right. Anything I can do, let us know. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. What a great experience. And it was wonderful to share space with Lauren Williams right here in the Sports Deli. You can find her again on Instagram or on Twitter at Lauren C. Williams at worth-winning.com or at lauren-williams.com. Remember, your voice matters when fighting systemic racism. We encourage you to read a book, acknowledge your white privilege, watch a movie about institutional racism, 
call your local or state representatives and or have a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you so that we can change the economic, educational, voting, police and prison narratives that currently need to be changed in this country. Until next time, please mask up, unlike the state of Texas, where we have some serious questions about the governor. And remember, Black Lives Matter. Peace.